Hi, uh, good afternoon, James. Okay. James? Yes, hi. How are you, sir? Very well. I just made it. I just ran from a, another meeting, so uh, I was worried I was going to be late, but I seem to be okay. Uh, you are okay. We'll go, we'll go for a couple more minutes here. Thanks for uh, joining us here for festivities. I believe you're in Amsterdam, right? That is correct. So I've, I, actually, I'm in a little cute little city called Den Bosch, about 70 miles south of Amsterdam. So yeah, be beautiful, you know, cobbled streets, clogs, the, the full tulip experience. <laughs> there you go. Wow. We got a travel <laughs> log here also, in addition to blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> okay now, so james now, now james uh, let me ask you this question you you mentioned 70 miles 70 kilometers south of yeah Amsterdam? something like that yeah so is that almost in france uh i don't know i mean uh look i live in australia so holland's pretty small uh and i've really enjoyed using the public transport you can seem to hop on a train and within an hour you're in you know the next city so uh, yeah, I, th I think we're kind of near the border. <laughs> Probably closer to Italy, right? With 70 yeah. kilometers. <laughs> Good deal. Okay, so so uh, James, how we're going to work this is I'll kick off here. Um, we're already recording. We're live streaming on YouTube uh, right now. So hello, everybody on YouTube. Uh, and then I'll after the introduction, I'll turn it over to you. And you can show your charts, and we'll go, and then we'll rock and roll from there. We finish by the uh, top of the hour uh, here, so everyone can run or walk or however they want to to uh, be a ch change their position um, out there for the next call meeting, etc. So we're going to go one more minute here, and then we'll uh, then we'll start. And. James, quick question for you while we're starting is, uh, do you like questions along the way or do you like to uh, have questions at the end? Look, I, I, I don't mind. I mean, sometimes people say questions along the way interrupt the flow, but um, that, that's fine for me. I mean, uh, if it's pertinent to the point, I, I'm happy to take it uh, there and then. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, that, that, that's good. And we'll, 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 keep it, we'll keep it on task here if uh, we get away from it. But generally, that's not people ask uh, good questions along the way here. Okay. So why don't we get rock and rolling here? Hello, this is uh, Tom Klein, along with uh, Eric Valaquette and uh, Andrea Frosinini. The, uh, we're all co-chairs for the Hyperledger Supply Chain and Trade Finance uh, Special Interest Group. So we're glad that you were able to join us here either live or on a recording today to hear from James Veal from SAP slash Green Tokens, and he'll explain that in a little bit, uh, how, how that all works here. Uh, first off, um, antitrust policy is up on the screen right now. Please don't share any competitive information. Don't collude on pricing and all these things. We want to have a competitive environment, especially in blockchains, since things are so early right now out there. So I'm going to stop sharing, and James, uh, you can grab it. and. Or Eric, if you could make them host, that would be good. Uh, number two here, while James is grabbing that for everybody, uh, Dublin in September is going to be the next global forum in person. Uh, Tomas, I don't know if there's going to be a live stream option. I haven't heard that at all, but I know it's happening in person in Dublin in September, so you can look at that. I also heard the, the call for papers closed two weeks ago, two weeks ago, Friday. Yes. For a week That's and a half ago, Friday. Okay. And so now the group is work going through all the submissions and seeing what we're actually going to be presenting. And Tomas, do you know if there's going to be a live stream option in September? Uh, right now, it's not planned to have it yet, but uh, we are looking into it and we will come back on that one. Okay, gotcha. So if you really want to go, book your flights to Dublin in September there, and there's information on the website there. So with that, um, let's get into our uh, speaker here, James. James from Australia, but James, as you heard, may have heard at the beginning, James is hanging out in Netherlands and he can tell us about the best tulip he saw over the last uh, <laughs> few days when he was there. Um, James, I, I, I don't, James, I don't even know how I found out about green tokens, but uh, I, I, I was doing some research and I was interested in 
as far as I know, Green Tokens is based on Quorum and we're a Hyperledger group. But what I'm seeing out there is a lot of combined types of solutions where both Ethereum and Hyperledger, various forms, usually fabric, are working together here. And so there's kind of two main reasons why. One, our, our thoughts or our theme for this year around sustainability for this group. Um, two, the interest in Hyperledger is increasing around tokens. And James and his group is already, is already doing some work around that. So I thought it'd be valuable for us to hear what they're doing and so we can use it in the various and sundry uh, applications and ideas that we have out there. So with that, James, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And uh, any questions, as James said, that he'd uh, be open to questions along the way if uh, you need something to help clarify uh, there. And then we'll at the end, we'll have some time with whatever to ask some final questions. So with that, James, it's all yours. Super, thanks very much, Tom. So. Good morning, I'm guessing, to most of you over in the US. Good afternoon for those of you in Europe. Yes, my name is James Veal. I'm the co-founder, along with Nitin Jain, of Green Token by SAP. And before I start, people always ask us, you know, are, are you an independent company? Are you part of SAP? So, yes, we're uh, an SAP venture. Uh, SAP, like all big tech companies, is always investing in external startups. Uh, we have a, a whole part of the business called SAP IO, which does that. Um, about four or five years ago, they opened that up to anybody. So anybody in the company could pitch an idea. Um, and uh, that's something that Nitin and I did uh, back in 2019. Um, we got funded in 2020. So we, we worked like a startup within SAP. So we have venture funding, we have KPIs, you know, the money runs out, we have to ask uh, for more. Uh, but it's great. So we have the best of both worlds. We're, we're agile, we can build product quickly, respond to our customers, but we can also leverage that massive SAP customer base and support network that we have. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit, we are 100% SAP uh, venture. Uh, I, look, I probably got a, a presentation that's like 20, 30 minutes long, um, but normally we have lots of questions. So I'm, I'm sure that, that we can get to the hour. Um, but I, I want to start with this. Okay, so a little bit of history on my background. Um, I'm a Brit, uh, although I've lived in Australia now the last 12 years. Um, my actual uh, background was commodity trading. My first job out of uni was as a very, very junior analyst on the trading floor with BP uh, in Broadgate Circle in London. Um, and that was interesting because a lot of the world see raw materials uh, or trade raw materials just in two kind of ways. They, they look at uh, the quality, does this meet my specification and the price? So think about when you fill your car with gas, you know, you, you know if, if you don't absolutely need it there and then, you probably drive around looking for the gas station, which has your quality that the car takes for the lowest price. Um, and, and that's how we treat raw materials. And what we do, we, we ignore a huge amount of the other interesting attributes that go with it you know is this a better greener option does this have child labor in it you know uh, does this cause deforestation there's all these in other interesting facts that we can't readily attach to raw materials well i know as commodities and another reason is that raw material supply chains tend to be in bulk they tend to you know we, we don't ship one shampoo carton worth of fuel we ship a whole tanker uh, and to fill that tanker, we don't get it from one source, we get it from many sources. And if it's refined unleaded fuel, then it's been refined at a refinery, probably over a period of many days into storage. So, so there's, there's this massive commingling problem in these raw materials. And if you want to say, well, I want something from this origin, but not from this, or I want something treated in this way, not from that, it's really hard to do. Now, traditionally, we've solved this with ERP systems. SAP ERP is a great, uh, um, a great obvious choice of that. But ERP systems see the world in batches. You know, they they work off of um, off of uh, document movement, so goods receipts, commercial invoice, and each of those encapsulates some material. You know, 100 tons of this, 100 tons uh, of that at a certain price. And, and those become little uh, 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 batches. And batches are fine if you're upstream, sorry, if, uh, fine if you're downstream. You know, if I'm making 100 iPhones or 100 packs of spaghetti, I want to put the batch code on there. If something goes wrong, I can do a recall. 
But when you're upstream with the raw materials, batches just don't work. You know, I have an inventory. I, 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 I build my inventory in a silo, you know, with a hundred different batches. Um, what do I do when I, and that all mixes together, that, that, that product will mix together, whatever it is, could be a, a crude oil. W what do I do when I actually start to use that inventory? You know, what, how do I know which batch I'm taking it from? Uh, and, and, and really you don't, you have to use convenient accounting rules like LIFO or, or FIFO to say, well, I, the last one that came in is the one I'm gonna, gonna use first. And yet, you know, and I know that the, the material in there is completely co-mingled, some with good origins, some with bad, uh, bad uh, uh, origins. So look, that's, just, that's a fairly lengthy intro to say that that's the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying to give, you know, really good traceability to raw materials. So people are able to make informed decisions and, uh, and also drive things like the adoption of sustainable uh, practices. So I'm now going to talk to you how we solve that solution. Um, and we have many use cases, but this is a use case that we're doing quite well with. Uh, and this is to do with circular plastics. So circular plastics, if you don't know, um, over 80% of the world's plastics end up in landfill or being burnt, um, which clearly isn't good because not only do we have to replace it with new plastic from crude oil, uh, but there's this associated environmental damage done with those practices. But there is a way to pretty much recycle any plastic providing it doesn't have chlorine uh, within it. So any non-chloride uh, plastic can be recycled through something called chemical recycling, which is a process where you basically take uh, the plastic, the, the plastic uh, bonds in the polymer, you chop those bonds up and you have something that looks a bit like uh, uh, soup. Uh, we call it synth oil, which looks like crude oil. And then you can put it through the oil refinery again and make new plastic. Um, and you can do that countless times. So it's, it's clearly uh, a more environmental way. We start to see plastic as a plastic waste as a resource uh, and not a problem. Uh, but the problem with that, or rather the advantage of the plastic it makes is identical to plastic made from, from crude oil. So the, the question was, how can we go ahead and prove that uh, this new circular plastic really is from waste? Um, and this is where we introduced, you know, we had three sort of innovations that drove uh, Green Token. And, and the first innovation very much is the token. And this is how we got rid of the batch. So the token uh, replaces the batch, or rather we make the batch tiny. So you can see there, uh, our token is a digital twin of the original raw material, the original source commodity, in this case, plastic waste. Uh, and the token represents a tiny amount, in this case, one gram of waste. So if I had a, a kilo of waste, that, that, would be, um, that would be a thousand tokens. Um, and the reason it's small is because a, a token can't be divided. Uh, so the token has to be the smallest unit of measure that you would trade at. Uh, and for this example, it was a gram. And, and look, we're not, we're not tied to the metric uh, system. We did a a POC with uh, a soybean customer in the US in, in, in Iowa and we had, a, we had bushels and all sorts of wonderful uh, units of a measure there. But um, so, so, uh, so the first concept is that the token is a digital twin of the underlying physical and wherever the physical moves down the supply chain, so the token has to move with it in, uh, in, in concert. So in this example, I've got two uh, sources of plastic waste. I've got uh, plastic waste from uh, a post-consumer uh, 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 origin. So this could be plastic waste from my trash can that I've collected and, and sorted. And I have plastic waste from another unknown uh, location. And when I get to the MRF, the material recycling facility, these get co-mingled. So you can see now with the tokens, if I've got, um, I don't know, a uh, hundred tons of waste in my material recycling facility at, at any one time, I will have a uh, hundred tons equivalent of tokens of different colors, you know, green showing there from collective post-consumer waste, uh, gray showing there from some uh, other source or indeed even, uh, even virgin uh, crude uh, uh, oil. So this is how I'm starting to assign an identity 
uh, to the material that I want to, to track. So that, that's the first uh, concept that we have. The, the second concept is mass balance. Um, and all mass balance is, is really is, is an, a, a, an accounting principle that says within a system, within a closed uh, system, uh, within a given time period, an hour, a day, a week, uh, a, a month, whatever comes into my system, I can account for it uh, coming out, including any conversions, any losses that might happen um, along the way. So in this, you can see I've got plastic waste uh, uh, coming in. I'm doing some sorting. I'm doing some chemical recycling to uh, synth oil. Uh, I, you know, it's not 100%. I, I know I lose some uh, material, some mass during that process. And I end up with a, a product. It could be a monomer feedstock or a new uh, polymer. And what Green Token does, it will say, well, you know, uh, if I put in 2,000 tons within the month and I've come out with 1,500 tons of usable new circular material, it'll show me, it'll attribute the amount from, from the various uh, uh, sources. And so that, that mass balance principle just lets you uh, keep those equations uh, in, in sync. So I, I can see there uh, in my output material, the percentage in this case, I'm showing 65% from a post-consumer uh, waste uh, source and 35% from some um, other, uh, other source. So, so uh, tokens is the first principle we came up with. Mass balance is the second to deal with these, these commingled um, materials. Now we come to the blockchain. So the idea here was, yeah, this is fine. Sorry, is question. there a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, so basically you're just taking whatever ratio the inputs are, you're gonna apply the same ratio when, you, when the outputs is what- Correct, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, and you see there that we actually retire some tokens, you know, if, if it's not a, a perfect, uh, and it, it never is. Uh, and these ratios, uh, what we tend to do, we, we predefine them and then we square, square them up, you know, so a bit, again, a bit like financial um, accounting, we make the best guess and then you might make a, a small uh, correction error at the end of the accounting period. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, and, then we, uh, and, then, and then we came to trust, you know, which is really our, our third uh, uh, innovation. So we have the token, we have the mass balance, that's fine, that's accounting for the, the digital twin, the flow of our material. Now it happens that the, the downstream uh, benefactor, the, the, the purchaser of the, in this case, the recycled circular plastic, really don't know who the waste collectors are, you know, and, and why, why would they? And they probably don't know who the chemical recycling plant is, um, is, is either. So how can they trust the data? How can they trust when we say this is from a post-consumer source that I collected at, at the curbside? How can we really prove that that, that is true? And this is where blockchain uh, really plays. So having that ledger, having the ability to move the token along the ledger, uh, and as you know, all the blockchain is, is really a fancy uh, ledger. I, I can never delete a record from the blockchain. I can ever make sequential uh, writes, sequential uh, uh, up, uh, uh, updates to the ledger as the token flows along. And so at each of these axes, they have a wallet on the blockchain. And as material moves down the chain, so we, we move the tokens from wallet to wallet. And that gives us some wonderful uh, um, outcomes. The first one is uh, at the downstream customer ends, you know, to audit it, to say, why is this claim green is trivial. We just look at the unique uh, uh, token and we look for all the occurrences of that on the blockchain and we get that complete history of, of why we're making that, um, uh, that uh, claim. We're also able to add multi-facts to the uh, token uh, I'm not sure if, you, if it's being blocked out, but here we can see some interesting things, not only the quantity and the material name, but also uh, the origin. We've done, you know, the actual latitude and longitude of where we picked up the material. Uh, we can add sequential uh, CO2 footprints information. We can add any sort of certification that goes um, along with that, uh, things like uh, no child labor, all, all sorts of interesting uh, facts can be carried. Um, but yeah, but the, the, this is this is the basis of how green token works, and we prove this at scale. I pause there because this is when I normally get lots of questions. 
<laughs> well, let's pause here. And uh, Fernando had a question. Uh, first, he said, thanks for all uh, the presentation, James. I wonder if you have any tag to link the physical plastic with the digital twin. So let's no, start with I'm, that one there. Yeah. And then uh, we'll open it up for voice questions. No, and we 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 deliberately don't have a tag, and I, I'll tell you for why. So um, we, we we're mainly putting this over uh, SAP ERP chains, um, and the SAP ERP is always in that batch world. And the problem with that is you you know I have one batch which is 100% uh, recycled, the next batch has nothing within it. And again, as I mentioned before, the SAP system unless it creates a new batch, but then you're doing that constantly, because remember, these are constantly flowing supply chains. They're not, they're not like, you know, I'll make um, 100 loaves of bread and then I will stop. Um, you, they, the ERP just doesn't make a new batch. So what it does, it does the, the, the FIFO or the life or whatever rule you want to, to do. The problem with that is you don't, you're not reflecting the true mix. You know, I'll have one batch which would be completely recycled. The next won't have anything within it. Where we do square up is if you look at, the, you know, again, back to accounting principles, if you look at the start of the month and the end of the month, the inventories of tokens will always match the inventories of what you physically have uh, within your system. Okay, good. Fernando, you can uh, either chime in with a voice uh, question or in the chat there if you want to go a little bit further on that. Uh, hopefully, you can answer the question. Okay, thank, thank you very much, James. Could you, could you hear me? Yes, hi. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you very much for the presentation. It's, it looks amazing. I, I am kind of involved as well in the, in the use of blockchain in the, in the supply chain. I'm just wondering how you, I mean, when we are speaking about mass balance, usually, I mean, many of the systems we can, or many of the certifications we have now in the market, I don't know, fair trade certification, for example, use this kind of mass balance approach. You know? How we can make sure that plastic that we are tracking on the digital twin is no replace for another kind of plastic in the physical flow? I mean, because we have to flow, information flow that is quite clear on the blockchain, no? but the physical flow, how do you, how how do you ensure the integrity of the system? Yeah, sure. So uh, a number of things there. So firstly, we design the system based off uh, ISCC, so ISCC uh, white papers. So we fully uh, conform to their specification. Secondly, we are an accounting system. We, we're not the certifier. So we are we are a system that says whatever information you put in, we'll make sure it flows out the uh, other side, and we. We we'll make sure there's no double uh, uh, counting. So we always work, you know, every time we deploy this, um, the companies we're working with are, are always being certified by an ex to an external uh, standards. So ISCC, uh, Red Certs, RSPO, there's a, a, any number of certifications uh, that are out there. And those companies are already having to prove their supply chains through onerous paper trails across many uh, supply chain uh, partners. So I guess the answer to you is uh, no, that's not not us. We're not we're not actually proving, uh, you know, whether it really is true information or not. Uh, but we're certainly accounting for it as it flows through. And in our experience, um, the the actors uh, the actors they that they want this positive um, effects. One other consideration, ISCC. So let, let's say in a month I have uh, 5,000 tons going through uh, my supply chain. It's, it's perfect conversion. So 5,000 tons of waste gives me 5,000 tons of products of which uh, 1,000 tons is certified uh, sustainable. And I'm, I've definitely recorded that and I'm happy. Uh, so I made 1,000 tons of green tokens. What I sell at the downstream end really doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter whether it comes from the sustainable source or the non-sustainable source. The ISCC rules say that I can only sell 1,000 as identified as uh, from a sustainable source. Once I've done that, I, I can't sell any more as green, as uh, sustainable. Uh, now, now, that is a feature of mass balance. Whether you agree it's, uh, it's valid or not, 
Uh, we can have a whole hour discussion <laughs> within that. Um, our, our view is that it is valid because you're not doing any double counting. And our view is because you can measure it, you're now at a state where you can actually increase that 1,000 to 2,000, identify the actors who are giving you the right material. So I hope that answers your question. Um, I hope you don't feel cheated by the answer, uh, but th these are these are ISCC rules that we uh, conform to. Yeah, you absolutely answer answer my question. Thank you very much for the for the for the reply. Thanks. So, so I think what I'm hearing, James, this is Tom, uh, yeah. that on the origin there, there are certifiers that are saying, hey, this is good stuff that you know whether it's in your green it's a green example or it's a it's a gray example there and somebody's certifying it and giving it the blessing and saying yeah it's good so that you then assume so that's in effect your tag is through a third party certifier yes uh correct and and something we built in the system is is that you see there if i say auditing is trivial with chain of custody block chain ledger i mean that's the real that's the real win you know that ability to say Okay, you, you've outturned a thousand of green. Um, show me all your months uh, outturns. I want to check that you haven't done a thousand and one or a thousand and 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 twenty. Uh, we we work with people who are doing these paper certificates, and the number of times they get presented twice, you know, either because people are trying to game the system or often just uh, human error. So you know, by having this digitized, by having this on on the chain. Uh, which gives you that ledger certainty. You know, we, we know we've invented a better system. Is it perfect? No. Uh, do people try and game it? No. But like any financial accounting system, having the complete record means you're able to spot these errors a lot quicker. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Eric and Tomas, I, I, uh, if you see, or if you could go on the live stream and see if there's any questions there, uh, I'd appreciate it. Uh, because James, you're probably looking at the screen in the presentation there. <laughs> so we'll, we'll keep feeding them to you. Anybody else uh, having a question immediately right now? Otherwise, we'll let James uh, continue rolling on. Okay, James, why don't you continue? And Eric or Tomas, if you could come back with any questions from the live stream a little bit later, we'll, we'll uh, pick them up then. Yeah, sure. So, um, so, so look, this this general principle works for many many different uh, industries. So the deck I have here is sort of geared towards uh, hydrocarbons, plastic recycling, chemical uh, uh, recycling. Uh, this one's pretty big in Europe. So in Europe, they still have diesel cars. Um, the European spec called EN five ninety uh, calls for seven percent. Uh, actually, actually, I think it's more like ten these days. Uh, certainly when I traded it, it was around 7%, had to be from a renewable source, so non-mineral uh, non crude oil uh, source. Um, and then, you know, that there were some complexities around that. So uh, you can make this, this stuff called fatty acid methyl ester from many different uh, origins, so oil seeds, uh, waste cooking oil, um, animal fats. So fine, if I'm doing it from oil seeds, I guess I want to do it from oil seeds that aren't grown on a recently deforested uh, place, you know, so some that have some sort of certified sustainability. So here you can see it works in much the same way. We have our inputs there on the left hand side. Um, interesting one here as well. So Germany uh, will not take um, biodiesel that's made from animal fat. So that might be something that they'd be very keen to have you certify that you aren't uh, feeding them uh, uh, biodiesel from uh, animal fats. But the purpose of this really is to show you uh, that it works for many different uh, use cases. Uh, the, the, the one that I want to show you as well, and this is quite close to my heart. So uh, Australia is betting big on green hydrogen as kind of a, a transition energy store. Um, and just have a think about what green hydrogen is. I mean, hydrogen doesn't really uh, uh, exist in, um, uh, you know, we, we don't have hydrogen in the atmosphere like, like we do with uh, oxygen. Uh, my, my colleague here is uh, pinging me. <laughs> um, but but it, it, it's, it's really useful uh, to, to store uh, renewable, energy so green hydrogen is hydrogen made from the electrolysis of water so passing a strong dc current through uh, water 
Uh, if you do that with a renewable energy source like solar or wind power, uh, then the gas that is made, uh, you can claim has energy stored in it when you 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 burn it, uh, and uh, has a very low carbon uh, footprint. Uh, the way we normally make hydrogen is to do something called steam methane reforming, which is where you take natural gas and you basically strip off the carbon from the hydrocarbon chain, but that carbon then goes either into the atmosphere or you have to do something clever and try and store it within the ground. The output of both those processes is hydrogen, uh, H2, and by looking at it, you can't tell whether it came from the, the, the good to low carbon source or the, the, the not so, uh, so, so good. And hydrogen in itself is pretty useless unless you use it at source. It's the lightest element. So uh, to transport it, you need uh, to compress it, which is energy intensive, or what people are doing now is they convert it to liquid ammonia, which uh, is a great you know, higher density energy store, which you can ship. So uh, I'm personally working, our group's working with um, uh, the the Australian German Hydrogen um, Alliance. Europe now is, is very keen to find replacements for Russia gas and also uh, very keen to actually find lower carbon alternatives. And the beauty of hydrogen is you can pump it into the natural gas network pretty much as it is in fairly low percentages, uh, but but book uh, a, a carbon saving straight away. So we've deployed the system and it's the same thing. So we deliver the hydrogen gas, uh, we deliver the tokens as well, showing the, the origin, um, and then people are able to use those uh, uh, tokens to make uh, lower carbon claims uh, uh, for their primarily their, their energy generation uh, uh, business. So really the last two slides to show, yes, I, I showed you one example, but this is uh, adaptable to many, many uh, 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 use cases. Uh, we did a big trial with Unilever. Uh, it's on our, our website, the joint press release, where we were showing that the palm oil they sourced in Indonesia was not from recently deforested uh, Areas and again, we we attributed different tokens at origin uh, depending on where the palm came from. Uh, those tokens carried latitude and longitudes, uh, as well as any other certifications like RSPO and no deforestation uh, certificates. And then in the end, products which were many many ways removed from the supply chain. It was you know palm fruit crushed to palm oil, then refined to Oleans and then put on a ship to Rotterdam to be, you know, uh, mixed into various uh, products. Uh, we could prove down to the bottle the origin of, of the palm and the fact that it wasn't from uh, deforestation. So I just, just want to give you some idea of how we found these tokens really flexible. We can alter the payload uh, on the tokens uh, depending on whatever the application uh, is. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't have a huge much more to say. I have some now some some screenshots uh, of what the product looks like. Um, uh, oh yeah, sorry. This, this, uh, well, before I go there, there's this something else that we we are considering. So all of our customers talk about carbon, and, and as as we know, there's there's huge amount of of carbon reporting requirements uh, either in place uh, or, or or coming. Uh, we have the concept of scope one, two, and three. I have strong views on that, but again, that's for a different, <laughs> uh, a different um, uh, discussion. Um, but basically, uh, scope one is my carbon uh, emissions from uh, my activities. Scope two tends to be the carbon from the power that I'm consuming, and scope three tends to be the carbon from um, you know when I transport my goods uh, between different uh, uh, sites. Uh, my personal view is that uh, I, I think I think that that's a convenience accounting framework for us, um, and and what we what we've realised at uh, Green Token is that at each of these stages we could not only add that provenance uh, information and origin information to the token, uh, but as the token moves along the chain, we could start writing a little bit of uh, you know per that gram uh, a token a little bit of. The total carbon footprint it's gained to that 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 place. And then you can see here that this is a uh, we're harvesting grain in Western Australia, and we we ship it to uh, a grain storage site, and we take it to a metro grain centre where it's dried and it's mixed. 
and then we take it to a Western Australia port and then we put it on a vessel. Um, so our idea is that as the token moves along representing that this is ISCC certified sustainable grain, we can also show, well, there's a bit of carbon here uh, from the truck movement. And then at the upcountry side, it gets, you know, it has a bit of carbon uh, added to it a bit more when the train goes, a, a bit more when it's dried and blended at the grain center. Uh, so not only do you land it up with a, you know, a carbon footprint uh, per token, uh, per, per gram, but also you have that fantastic audit history. If somebody says to you, well, why is it that, that, that number? Again, we look back, uh, the tokens are on the chain to really, uh, really understand how we've, we've got to that um, number. And that evidence really isn't available today. A lot of the product footprint management tools just give you a number and all the calculations is hidden uh, behind the, the, the scene. The, the big problem with carbon accounting too is, uh, is you know, what, what is my scope three carbon emissions becomes your, uh, your scope one. So often, you know, numbers can be misled or double counted or not counted uh, at all. So our, our feeling is that this is a much better approach. And this is something we're, we're working to add to the product. Um, yeah, and and really now uh, I've just got some. Uh, oh yeah, no, th 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 this this is uh, this one's quite good. So uh, this is just to underlie how the system works. So here we have five swim lanes, our supply chain actor, the physical material, the uh, a document from the ERP. Uh, there's our stylized uh, blockchain with some uh, wallets, and we have some inventory numbers um, uh, below. And I, I think you can probably guess what's coming. But as the physical material flows, uh, we we see we see a document that represents the batch. So this could be a, a goods receipt or a Weybridge uh, a ticket. In this case, the you know the the, the waste collectors delivered waste material to the material recycling facility. Um, and then this is where we run some business rules. So we've had 400 tons of waste um, uh, arrived. Hey, it's all from post-consumer collections at the curbside. We know our customer who's a CPG customer is really interested in that because they want to uh, buy plastic, circular plastic material that comes from uh, post-consumer waste because they probably put it into the supply chain. Uh, and here we go. So th this is our, our concept. We add uh, you see here the physical inventory will go up by 400 tons, but so's my token count gone up by uh, the same um, amount. So this shows you how we we move in in concerts. The material recycling facilities uh, got all the soft plastic out of there, sent it to a chemical recycler called uh, Alpha. Again, a goods receipt uh, ticket. Now this is where we're slightly different. So in this case, the chemical recycler says. Hey, I believe this is you sold this to me based as post-consumer waste. Uh, I got 400 tons. I'm requesting 400 tons equivalent of tokens to come um, across. So that's done automatically in the green token uh, uh, clients. And then it's up to uh, the the upstream uh, supply chain actor, the material recycling facility, to push the tokens across. And they you you saw them move. And the beauty of this is. The tokens leave the MRF wallets and they can no longer be spent. So they they've already been transferred across to guarantee that 400 tons. Um, so this eliminates that double counting. And also, as, as you see, they've they've now moved from the MRF wallet to the chem recycling uh, uh, wallet. And in doing so, they're starting to build up what we call that chain of cust that custody, that the history uh, of where these tokens uh, have uh, ha have been. And that, that keeps uh, repeating, uh, and then the tokens keep moving, uh, we request, we uh, deliver. And the real end game there is the customer. The, the, the customer really is the, the best net uh, benefactor of this uh, uh, information. Let's say it's a consumer product uh, company who, who bought some uh, uh, recycled plastic for their packaging, um, and they can see that it came from uh the the waste collection of amsterdam and it was the it wasn't industrial waste uh collection it was the the recycling bins of the good people of Amst uh amsterdam and that they can make that claim then when they make new packaging uh materials so i, I hope that little flow makes some sense um hey tom i can't see the clock so i i, I don't know how i'm doing for time 
Let's see here. I got 39 after here. So that's about 40 minutes. So yeah. why, don't we, why don't we take a break here? Let's let you get, yeah. Yeah, get your breath and uh, see what questions, Eric or Tomas, any, anything from uh, YouTube out there that we should bring out? Unfortunately, Tom, our, our uh, live stream was having technical issues. So no live stream today, but we are recording and we will definitely share the uh, the recording after the fact. I do see a couple of questions though in the uh, in the chat box here. Okay, good. So let's see. We got uh, Dennis Kaskun. Dennis from uh, Netherlands, right? What is your reference in calculating the carbon footprints? So, there, I, Dennis, I, I, you I, yeah, yeah. So, so again, you know, we we are the accounting system. We we don't calculate it. We we rely on third party systems to give us that that number. SAP has some. Uh, many vendors uh, have them, but we will record it. And we can, we can even record the methodology that has been used to uh, calculate. Okay, good. Dennis, hopefully that answers the question there. Um, come back if uh, there's more. Uh, it's, it's some, I guess, a question that I have for you, and then we'll get to Jennifer's question that just popped up, is um, these tokens. It sounds like it's a closed system. You're not viewing this as taking these tokens and turning it into some sort of external value in any way, shape, or form. It's really just an accounting mechanism, as you said at the beginning, in order to transfer the information is really what it's turning out to be. Yeah, it, it's, it's um, you, you could argue they're asset backed. You know, each token represents an underlying physical quantity that we want to attach facts to. And, and you know, again, think of the token as a tiny, tiny batch, uh, which means we can actually rather than having to worry about, you know, LIFO, FIFO taking 100 tons of something because that, that's what the last batch was, I can take 100 tons equivalent of, of tokens. That might be a billion tokens, but we, we get down to that wonderful resolution that really reflects what's in um, inventory rather than the artificial convenience uh, LIFO and, and FIFO view. Beautiful, good. So there's a question from uh, Jennifer London. Do you think that this could lead to some sort of exchange of green tokens between various materials producers? So I guess that's a little bit of what I was kind of going. <laughs> well, it, you know, that, that's an interesting question. So our, our vision would be a green token uh, network. So currently, you know, when we deploy this, we're having to onboard supply chains. So we're going to, well, let, let's talk about uh, Unilever uh they they had supply chain partners called golden agri who have palm mills in indonesia uh other supply chain partners called um uh, uh, uh cinemas uh, sespa who have um uh, uh, uh olean refining plants so uh we had to make sure each of those had a green token client so that the tokens were generated and passed as the physical went down the stream now wouldn't it be great if uh, we had a network and everybody was on green tokens so that whatever materials were produced, you know, uh, across the supply chain were offered with tokens. So I wouldn't have to on board, I would just have to find you know, what I, whatever the product is and there are the tokens. And the tokens then become the guarantee for whatever facts, it's just sustainable, uh, no deforestation, child labor, child uh, labor free. Yeah, quite some way away from there, but that's that would be our vision. Beautiful, beautiful. What are questions we have out there uh, from folks? Good questions so far. I don't know if uh, James, you you mentioned you had a few screenshots. Maybe it'd be yeah. worthwhile to show one or two because you know I, one of my questions is, uh, you know, can you do EDI to get this information back and forth? Is this API? Sounds like you got a screen, and maybe that's where you enter in all the, all the information. So maybe you can comment on that too. Yeah, and it, it's it's a good point. So yeah, we we, we are backed by uh, SAP, and at the downstream end of town, everyone has SAP uh, ERP. So we've written in integrations. To be honest with you, there's not that many touch points. It's certainly uh, uh, inbound goods receipts. It's outbound delivery documents, be that commercial invoice or some sort of uh, ticket, and it's certainly something to do with conversion. You know, so if I'm taking, uh, yeah, if I'm uh, processing a material, um, and we we have the same. So again, with the Unilever trial, uh, we, in in the rainforests of Indonesia, they don't have SAP. 
Uh, they do have internet. Um, uh, I've been based in Asia now, or, or uh, APJ for twelve years, and and those Asian countries, they kind of they kind of skip the whole uh, hardwire phone internet and went straight to you know radio phone uh, telephone masts. So uh, you always get quite good uh, coverage, even in quite remote uh, areas. You just need to put one mast in a village, and and you're done. So. Uh, we, we moved 188,000 tons of uh, palm through that, uh, that trial with Unilever. All, all 188,000 tons was record, recorded uh, at, at the mills we used. Um, and we did it by taking their delivery tickets, which had all the information because they know who they're buying from, uh, and uploading those uh, as kind of flat files into the system. So yeah, so we have a number of ways to get information in um, to reflect the supply chain. Um, yeah, and and look, the, the, this is kind of, uh, this is kind of, um, this is, these are some screenshots. It's an accounting system. I'm, I'm not gonna hide the fact that it's not particularly sexy looking. It's showing you inventories and sustainable uh, uh, balances. This is showing me uh, conventional feedstock inventory, recycled feast, recycled poly polyester inventory, and a couple of uh, products which are 25% and 50% uh, renewable. I'm seeing a forward view of my inventory uh, based on some uh, time periods there. Uh, this one is much more interesting. So this is our chain of custody. It might be a little bit small. Uh, but what this is showing, I wonder if I can zoom in a bit, uh, I can't, but what is showing on the right hand side is an end product, which is a recycled plastic bottle made of a bottle and a lid. Uh, and, and the actual green bar chart is showing you uh, graphically the, percent, the, the sustainable uh, percentage. Now this chart is made up from the tokens. So uh, the tokens are associated with the end products in the bottle. We track all those back to see all the sources of, uh, of origins. And there you can see on the far left-hand side, we have uh, six um, uh, collection points. So six uh, sources of recycled uh, waste. Uh, then we have some intermediary uh, processes. So that would be um, the chemically recycling. Some of those are 100% sustainable material. Some uh, are, 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 are not. Then we have various processes to make the various different um, uh, components of the bottle to end up with the end, uh, end bottle. So if we're selling this bottle as a 50% uh, from uh, old plastic uh, circular uh, bottle and somebody says, well, well, we'll prove it, uh, this is exactly how we would show that information. Uh, and here it is again in, in the list form. And this is the kind of information that auditors love. This is... This is the information that previously you've had to go back through tons of delivery receipts and uh, you know really try and figure out. Again, you, you're kind of doing um, allocations uh, of material to say, well, I think this this uh, this load went to this using your uh, LIFO and FIFO uh, uh, rules, and we, we have that much finer uh, view of it. So we just have to interrogate the tokens. Uh, this is a, another view we have. We call this a chain of custody map. Uh, because we know the latitude and longitude uh, locations uh, of all the sources, I think this was for a soybean uh, uh, example, uh, we knew where the farm co-ops were, we knew where the trucks moved from and to. So we, we, could, we, could get a, we could start getting some graphical views of uh, which farms were producing the certified sustainable uh, uh, goods. We did toy using this possibly to add in scope three carbon information, you know, if you know, uh, you know, the transport method, truck or train, and you know the distance, and you can start to, uh, to guess that, but then we decided that there were much better tools out there to give us uh, that kind of information. But these views are interesting. The, the, these views can actually show things like your food miles or your, your, your product miles, it, it could be you want to choose something which has a smaller, more local chain than one that comes from further afield. Um, this is a further, yeah, this is probably, a, I should have shown this one before. This is, a, 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 again, we're showing uh, many products on the right-hand side um, uh, and the origins of those um, uh, through the molder, through the uh, plastic recycler, through all of the uh, pickup points um, uh, in that graphical uh, view. 
this one we're showing as well because we're showing the uh, the, cum the cumulative CO2 equivalent um, uh, numbers associated. And again, we're doing that by summing up uh, the numbers, the, the carbon footprint added to the token as it moves uh, along the supply chain. Uh, yeah, we just, and you can zoom in, into this, of, of, uh, of course, and see finer detail. Yeah. And look, James, this, and, a quick yeah. question on the certifier. Sure. Um, yeah. The certifier, are you going straight to the certifier? Or are you taking, hey, the farm, you know, we, we, we've we contracted with certifier XYZ and they're telling you we use certifier XYZ and you're just taking that information in. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, again, you know, we, we are the accounting. So if you think of a financial accounting system, I, I can cook the books in a company's financial <laughs> accounting system, but I'll, I'll soon get found out. Uh, right. So we're the same, you know, if, if um, what, what, what we can do, you know, if, there, if there's a reference to, you know, if ISCC or ISPO, one of the certifiers uh, awards a sustainable, a sustainable certificate, um, uh, because that farm is certified sustainable, uh, we will attach that certificate reference to the token uh, and it can be in, inspected. Um, and look, in the cases that we've worked with, people are very keen to keep their certification. So they're not looking to game it. Uh, and also with green token, we can expose if people are gaming it, uh, we can expose that a lot quicker. So um, yeah, I think we have to believe in the milk of human kindness <laughs> occasionally. Yeah. Yeah, good, good. Thanks. Um, I look, I think the final thing I'm going to show is this. Uh, although I got an idea this this QR code isn't working, I would I would often ask you to shine your I don't know, uh, we can give it a go. Just shine your phone at that QR code. Um, uh, it may work, it may not. Uh, it's on a test server. Uh, but we want to expose that information to um, I don't know, is it working there, Tom? No. Yep, it looks like it's working. Green token product scan, blah, blah, blah. Would like to access the camera. Okay, okay. Uh, that means oh, wait, it's... Okay, there we go. Yep, I got it. Product data undefined, not found. Okay, it's fine. Okay, data. so 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 th th this is one that we saw on our test server that it's not working. But if it was working, uh, you would see uh, this user app. So we, we know the real value of this. Okay, what do we want to do? We want to drive change. We want to expose the information that's in raw materials that it's being ignored today. Uh, so we want to work with our customers and, and allow them to put uh, a QR code on their products, which, which shows the, the journey. You know, not only, you know, we can, we can make the claim this is re recycled, but let's actually go ahead and expose that uh, in, in depth. So uh, I, happily, I, I can send you a QR code afterwards that I know does work. I apologize, I've been rushing around today. I should have checked this uh, prior. But no, no worries, no worries. Yeah. Send, send it along and we'll, uh, we'll include it in, the, um, in our wiki as well as put it out on LinkedIn. But you know, th this becomes a great marketing tool. This, this is now enabling the consumer to make informed dis decisions. Uh, and we believe in the power of the consumer. You know? So if more people only want to buy certified sustainable or child labor free or no deforestation um and they have that proof then we, you know uh, we we create that virtuous circle where people have a preference for this uh, over other products yeah so i think i think that's about what i wanted to say today tom um happy to take some more questions beautiful let's open it up for questions we're at 53 after the hour or seven minutes before the top of the next hour here <laughs> so we've got probably got time for a couple of questions if they're out there let's take a pause okay well the good news is uh folks james stuck around to the end here so they like what you uh had to say here thank you very much for uh sharing uh what you're doing there with green token actually i do have one other question what what uh what ERC are you using for your tokens? Sorry, uh, what's what, what what token format are you using? Is it your own or are you using one of the ERC ones? Uh, we uh, look, uh, and you can probably tell because I hesitated there that I'm not the the technical guy. I'm pretty sure it's our own, uh, but I will get our tech guys to inform me. Of fair, that. fair enough. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. No worries on it. No, this is what we're looking for is more <laughs> of the business side of what you're trying yeah. to do here and how this all works. Yeah. So good. Any questions out there before we close? 
Okay. Oh, wait. Elizabeth, yes, the end user. Sorry. Oh, wait, here. We got end user. Can the end user get the tokens reimbursed? Sorry, I'm not quite. And then you yeah, see, so you, can the end good. user use those tokens to get reimbursed for having paid for the verifications because the product is getting closer to the true cost pricing by having the each person along the way paying for a verification from a third party so these these green tokens end up in the pocket of the end yeah. user who bought that bottle right. drink now she wants to go into when she recycles it she wants to get the money back from all of that verification that she paid for yeah you know it, it, it it's a great observation so uh, our assertion is that having the tokens makes the product more attractive and therefore would attract a price uh, premium um, so yeah, we, we're just delivering that evidence. Uh, now, whether some companies want to be clever and offer some more incentives around that, that could be a pretty good idea. What is interesting, we're working with a company in Japan who are making sushi trays, and they make rather a lot every day, being the national lunchtime dish, and they are collecting the trays. Uh, and the idea is, you know, each trays have some unique tokens represented by the QR code. It could be that you know we we have that complete circular uh, uh, process, and the trays go around multiple times. And so if we get a tray with a QR code, and you know there's there's challenges around how do you scan those millions of trays, uh, but you know once that information's in there, we could start having a count. We could say this tray has been seen twice, been seen three times. So th there's another interesting you know uh, consumer I uh, incentive. Do you have the highest number of round trips on your uh, sushi tray. But yeah, it's interesting, um, Elizabeth, I think it might be outside of our scope, but uh, we have the evidence and possibly we could help uh, in some sort of scheme. Yeah, thank you. So I'd like I'd like to see that automatically put into my um, lifetime comprehensive environmental <laughs> impact calculator so that when she she ratchets up all of her points for her lifetime she gets these green tokens in her pocket to use to get some kind of compensation thank you yeah and i i and you're right and you you, you observe correctly you know the tokens never go away you know they're, they're they're unique and at the end of life you know they go to archive and they're, they're there to be queried uh, at some point yeah so that that's a a, a great idea my personal wallet uh, of all the tokens i've used in my entire life gosh there's so a she would have to <laughs> So she would have to use she would have to use blockchain to purchase that drink that bottled drink in order to get those tokens. Uh, not necessarily. She'd have to have she'd have we'd have to have she'd have to have a a, a wallet on our blockchain to, uh, or or you know or, or perhaps we do blockchain to blockchain uh, transfer. But you're right; those tokens would have to end up in her wallet some somehow. Good. Let's go to Fernando here with the last quick question <laughs> before we wrap up. Fernando, it's hey, yours. Thanks. thanks, Tom. Hello, James, again. Just wondering, I mean, you, you have mentioned a couple of proof of concepts. Yes. Do you have any project in production? I mean, in full production or just our proof of concepts? Um... Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's a great, it's a great uh, question. We, we will go in full production. Uh, we will go in full production uh, this year. So um, we have spent, you know, in two years, we've built a team of 20, we've uh, built out the products, we tested it at, at scale. Um, I'll be honest with you, what's stopping production is the contract. So we are currently negotiating contracts with a number of, of uh, partners. So we're very, very close. Okay, and just, go, just one more question, sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> if, uh, I mean, even if you can disclose it, I'm not really sure. Yeah. If, uh, what is the business model behind this? In terms of yeah, you, and look, uh, that that is a great question, and I wish I had a really great, simple answer for you. And this is one of the challenges we have because uh, I'll be honest with you, everybody wants this, but uh, nobody can agree on the best way to uh, to pay for it. So again, we could have another hour discussion. I was in the office here in in Den Bosch discussing the very same. So uh, we have a number of ideas around it, but yeah, uh, I I don't have a simple answer. Thank you. Here, here, exactly the same here in my side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With our solution. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, James, thanks for all the questions from everybody out there. Uh, James, I assume you're available via email if uh, there's yes. further questions. Yep. Go forward yep. here. Um, 
we will take the recording and uh, put it out there in the wiki and LinkedIn. Andrea is great uh, with that and getting it out there. So look for that fairly shortly. And then uh, maybe we'll even be able to get it out on YouTube. And uh, we've been consistently getting a few hundred people looking at the replays on YouTube. So uh, that'll help us too here. So James, thanks again. Uh, Andrea or Eric, anything else we should share here? No, nothing for myself. Tom, thanks for setting this up. I was late for the beginning. So thanks, James, for being with us today. And thanks to everybody for joining us. It was a great pleasure to hear from you. No worries. There's lots thanks, of guys. thank yous in the uh, there's there's lots of thank yous in the uh, chat here, James. So appreciate everything. And uh, you can look at those in recording and feel good. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, guys. Really, really enjoyed okay. uh, presenting. Enjoy the rest of the day, everybody. Bye.